Joining us now, former CIA and NSA director and retired Air Force General Mike Hayden. General, we appreciate the time. Obviously, your portfolio was not Veterans Affairs, yet you wore the uniform of this country and you have more than passing familiarity with testifying in front of Congress. As you hear what may have been transpiring with the VA, do you have a reaction for what Secretary Shinseki is facing today? Well, I think, J.D., the first thing I, I would say is I, I know Eric Shinseki, good and honest man, and a wounded veteran, wounded in Vietnam in his own right. So uh, here's a person who, who really will want to do the right thing. That's the first point. The second is, you know, I need to read the testimony in a little more detail, but based upon the accounts we've been getting so far, uh, I fear as if General Shinseki's remarks or how, how do you want to say it, over-lawyered, that uh, they're too cautious, that he's been counseled since there's an investigation going on. He, he cannot be seen as presuming conclusions. Uh, I, under, I understand all that, but, but, but sometimes you've just got to go out there and be a bit more forceful. I mean, at a minimum, um, certainly a line I used when I was in similar circumstances, we are prepared to follow the facts wherever they might lead, and we will take we will take appropriate action. General Hayden, uh, Secretary Shinsheki, as, as you point out, uh, a career in the military as an officer, uh, one who is highly regarded. You just recited his battlefield uh, uh, heroics, if you will. But the challenge of battling a vast bureaucracy, and in a sense, I suppose you went through a similar situation, albeit in, in a different uh, area of governmental responsibility, how difficult is it to move from command in the military to command of another government agency, what some might call a burgeoning bureaucracy? Yeah, look, I love the people at CIA. I, I really did, and I, I, I will always be honored to have been able to serve among them. But <laughs> J.D., I walked into my first staff meeting, and nobody stood up, <laughs> and I said, okay, this is going to be different. And, and here you've got General Shinseki uh, with responsibility for a very large bureaucracy. And, and one, frankly, that I think everyone admits, including General Shinseki, is still kind of paper-based and, and not in the digital age. And it's large, and it, it extends throughout the country. And, and, and so this, this is just a tremendous challenge. And then, J.D., let me throw an additional factor on here. And I think we can all agree these guys are under-resourced. And you've got this whole new generation of veterans, and now there's all this pressure to meet these performance standards. You know, when you force bureaucracies to go after performance standards for which you do not resource them, you end up with circumstances like this. And with this kind of circumstance, what we're seeing here uh, again, you, you uh, offer that remark about the transition to civilian leadership in government as opposed to the culture of the military, and yet this is a mission where you would believe that past military service and for General Shinseki, the fact that had, he had been wounded in battle, that it would almost be a reflexive priority. But again, the, the as you mentioned it, the paper culture of the VA it leads to inefficiencies, to say the least. And, and I believe you're talking about the, there's been another change, the mandate that our returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan have, uh, have an ability to reach out for post-traumatic stress. So that has added a new element to what had to, uh, to what is expected of the VA, correct? No, that, that's exactly right. And, and, and you know what? Uh, General Shinseki's drive and zeal to, to really provide services to, to these folks, um, you know, may, may have in its own dark way, and I don't blame this on the general at all, but, you know, he's in there in Washington demanding we must do better. And now you've got local organizations who have got to make it happen, perhaps with not nearly the resources they need, and, you know, human weakness being what it is, you, you end up with the circumstances we have. General, you, you talked about the transition from uh, paper to the digital age. 
perhaps it's time for us to transition to uh, continued debate about what is transpiring in this digital age in terms of monitoring conversations and conducting domestic intelligence. Uh, General, you wrote a column for the Washington Times likening last week's debate in Toronto to hockey night in Canada. There you were with uh, journalist Glenn Greenwald, who uh, continues to make claims about your stewardship of the intelligence community and domestic surveillance. Uh, now, with a few days' perspective, what, what can you tell us about that debate uh, last week in Toronto? Yeah, uh, actually, J.D., you know, I was partnered in the debate with Alan Dershowitz, of all people, and it was Alan and I against Greenwald and a, a young Internet entrepreneur, Alexis Ohanian. And um, uh, after about three or four days of, you know how it is when you come off stage, right? I should have said this, I should have said that. After three or four days of that, I went ahead and, and looked at the debate again. And, and the note I sent to Alan Dershowitz was, you know, Alan, we land a lot more punches than I remember. So I actually felt pretty good about the points we were able to make. And essentially, J.D., it was this. These are hard questions. I actually began the debate by simply saying, you know, Here's the debate proposition. State surveillance is essential to preserve our freedoms. And I said, we all know the answer to that. It depends. <laughs> it depends on the threat. It depends on the kind of surveillance. It depends on the oversight. And therefore, the facts really matter. And in Greenwald, by, by self-admission, J.D., he's not an objective reporter. He calls, him, calls himself an advocacy journalist. I've read reviews of his books of the book that just came out. And there are people who are on his side that say he has just gone over the top and not admitting of any restraint or lawfulness or concern by anyone on the other side. And, and frankly, that's the attitude and behavior I saw on the stage in Toronto uh, two weeks ago. So in addition to cat calls and objections to uh, your moral standing in that debate, let's, let's drill down in this book. For example, in his new book, he claims the NSA tampered with U.S.-made Internet routers. Uh, is there any veracity to that claim in his book, General? Well, okay, so here's what I can say about this, J.D. Number one, I'm not going to confirm or deny any actual operational activity on the United, part of the United States. But now step back and look at the claim, okay? The United States, it is claimed, intercepted the delivery of IT equipment overseas to legitimate foreign intelligence targets of the United States and manipulated that equipment so that the United States government could collect legitimate foreign intelligence. I'm, I'm trying to find the outrage here, J.D. You know what I mean? I, well, what, what obviously, is it, What this, is it you expect an espionage agency to do? The yeah, espionage agency conducts espionage, and, and I believe right. you have made the point that thus far, whatever your actions were in terms of uh, post-service uh, scrutiny, uh, not been found unconstitutional nor illegal. Let me ask you one parting question, a little less than a minute sure. and a half uh, remaining, General. Apparently, Sony Pictures has acquired film rights uh, to this book by Glenn Greenwald. Your reaction to the fact that you are going to be uh, fictionalized to a certain degree on the silver screen by way of Hollywood. Well, I, you know, I... I saw that, that they had picked up the, the rights. I mean, it's not a novel. It's, it doesn't have a plot line. There, I mean, it is, it is supposed to be a counting of what the government is doing to protect the American people. So I suppose they'll, they'll you know, put characters in there and have characters assume roles. But, um, you know, I, I probably won't be in line to see the movie. Uh, just for the record, do you have a favorite uh, someone cast to play you? Who would you like to see in that part? <laughs> yeah, Brad Pitt. <laughs> General Michael Hayden, we appreciate your time and your graciousness, also your perspective, not only on matters of intelligence and the ongoing debate, freedom versus security, but also some insights on the VA challenges. Thanks very much for your time, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Diddy. Thank you. Michael Hayden, the, the, you know, it's interesting. You read these spy novels, and a guy who is director of the NSA is supposed to be diabolical and conniving. 
The thing about Mike Hayden is he is such a genial guy. So nice. And 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 the one-liner about who do you want to play in the movies? Brad Pitt. Well, I can see the resemblance, can't you? I sure. think it works fine. Sure, maybe a Benjamin Button type resemblance uh, somewhere <laughs> in there. <laughs> well, but, yeah. you know, a good question, J.D., maybe to ask. Who plays Glenn Greenwald? John mm. Penn, maybe? Yeah, it probably fits John Penn's ideology. Um, I wonder, that. that's a very good question. Or maybe one of the guys from The Sopranos surviving... Uh, the guy that uh, wrote, uh, what was that? The Goombas Guide. Who was that guy? He's kind of a big hulking guy, and it looks like uh, looks like Glenn Greenwald kind of is of that vein. One thing we do know, Hollywood's tried this before. Benedict Cumberbatch portraying oh, yes. Julian Assange yeah, Julian from Assange. Wiki, WikiLeaks. Yes. That flick bomb. Uh, that's not what we're going to do here. We want you to stay tuned, and we'd love your input on the NSA and General Michael Hayden. Why don't you tweet us your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. There's also email and Facebook.